and welcome to Nimbia Show Reviews. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Twilight Genesis. G'day. And also Silver Quill. We're going on a book sortcation! Everyone, no need to bring your iPads, this will be loads of fun. And this episode is brought to you by Mr. Of Lag. Thank you, man, for giving us this topic to talk about. So, anywho, in this issue, Twilight Sparkle and Starlight Glimmers attempt to organize the books in the castle of the two sisters turned into a battle of egos. Hmm. Ego. But anywho, before we head on into the review, we gotta give first impressions. Silver, what do you think? Well, looking back on this issue, we want, we run once again into the issue of Jay Foskett's artwork. Some people enjoy it, some people seem to despise it, and if anything, this always sets the stage for the world we live in. Because this is a world where people can voice their displeasure directly to the artist, and usually the whole fandom looks the poorer for it. I, I could appreciate that folks don't really go for Jay's artwork, but to harass and harangue the guy about it is just seems in, inappropriate. You can have an opinion, you can vote with your wallet and not buy the comic, I understand that. But when people go after him on Twitter or try to make big, huge posts making fun of it, I feel like that's crossing a line. And I think back to my own childhood and... You know, there were issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that featured artwork that I really didn't enjoy, that I thought made the characters look very sickly, but I never thought about writing in and telling the artist to stop or quit his job or to just give up his career because, well, I'm not insane. But also, I feel like that's empowering yourself with authority you don't have. And I'll say, by and large, I still enjoy Jay Foskett's artwork. This issue will highlight some perspective issues, especially as character heights are involved, but we'll get into that with the nitty-gritty. Anyway, having gone on about the artist, let's talk about the story itself. In some ways, I wish Starlight could break away from Twilight for a little bit and work with one of the other main six. You've introduced this recurring character. She's a semi-regular on the show, and I feel like she could do more and grow more if she tested herself against other main six members. So far, she's really limited to Twilight. She is Twilight's student and an acquaintance of the main six. But the story is enjoyable, especially as they all uh, start to get on one another's nerves. But through it all, you find out that there's something else driving the, the conflict. You find out that there's an external influence. And when you bring in an external influence for a character spat... It feels a little less sincere. It feels like they don't have as much to learn from than if it had been born from within. So it's an enjoyable comic, and it has one of... Rarely, it's become more rare, I should say, that elements in Equestria are threatening. It used to be that there were timber wolves and hydras and cragodiles and all manner of creatures uh, that would try and attack the ponies, and that seems to have mellowed out quite a bit over the seasons. So I'm glad whenever the world has a menace that can challenge them. Okay, okay. And Twy, what about you? This is probably like the third time I've actually read one of the MLP comics. Oh my. I'm not totally invested in them, and this hasn't sold me on on the comics. Oh, uh, this comic specifically? Like, yeah, this comic specifically, like, hasn't convinced me to try and read the other comics, because it's just... I found it to be kind of mediocre, like it, it, it's very bland, in my opinion. I, I didn't wasn't all that invested in the story, and since it's very short, like there isn't much time to get invested in the characters and what they're trying to do. Does the art have something to do with your feelings about it? No, actually, uh, I'd say the art's probably the one thing that I walked away from this comic enjoying. Hmm. That's something interesting because personally in the comic book fandom of the Pony Universe, a lot of people do not like Jay Fosgit's art because of how the ponies look. And well, Jay Fosgit here does have an interesting style. I personally say that I do enjoy it. It takes time to get used to it and since I've been doing this for a while now, I gotten used to it and I like it. And you mentioned that this is your third book, right? 
Yeah, I think I've only read uh, two other comics before. I think one of the earlier Friends Forever, which I believe you uh, got, or got me to read a few weeks back. I forget which one it was. I think it was Friends Forever Volume. Should we have to check it? 34 probably? No, not 34. Um, don't remember. I think it was like 28 or something. Probably, probably. And... Yeah, it was uh, 20, 26 or 27, one of those two. Mm. I think it was 26. And then the only other one that I've sat down and read, which I don't think I finished because I didn't have all of it, was the comic which introduces a, another magic mirror. I forget which uh, series this comic was from, but it was the one that had the magic mirror that led to the world where there was a good guy Sombra. Uh, I think that would be the Reflections art comic, um, the Friendship is Magic series comic. Yeah, I think I think that was it. I just remember reading because I think that was sort of two part comic. Three, actually, no, four, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I just know that I've read like part one, and I didn't have the rest of it. Ah, all right, all right. But still, um, that one was done by Andy Price, which who is technically one of the best comic artists in the Pony um, universe. So. Yeah, um, that's interesting. And for you to enjoy Fosgate's art after looking at Price's work, hmm, call me impressed because not many people do. Well, I've read a lot of different Western comics in my time. So I've, I've read a lot of different uh, Marvel and DC comics. Mm-hmm. Not to a point where I'm like a, a comic nerd or anything. And crossing that with having read plenty of manga in different styles... And watching shows, I don't expect going to uh, a comic art, uh, going to a comic source of a TV show to look like the TV show. And I found the style that this art is done in. It fits for comics. I, I found that for a, a for a short comic with you know that's fairly straight to the point, it worked. The the, the eyes. Were, were big and expressive, and the faces were expressive. And generally, things looked, you know, cutesy and and just everything you would expect a comic about ponies to be. But my only complaint is that occasionally, the uh, the proportions on the ponies, the heads looked too big, the manes maybe a bit too poofy, and Twy's wings too small. But that's only here and there. For the most part, I saw no problems, and I don't, I don't get why people would complain. Unless, of course, earlier comics of his work were absolutely worse, which you know I have yet to see because I, this is my first time seeing this art. Mm, all right, understandable, understandable. And as for me, this comic specifically, this issue, I don't mind it. Um, this is the first appearance of Starlight Glimmer in the comic world, so there's a few hiccups bound to happen, like her main style, her progression in her studies and whatnot. But still, those were easily forgivable with uh, the setting that's trying to set. The story here with how um, you need to compromise is key to well, solving a problem. Yeah, um, so what can I say? It's interesting. Like, it's an interesting story. Anywho, uh, if you guys have not read this comic, please do. It's a fun read. Anyway, uh, let's head into reviews. So anyway, we start off the comic with Twilight. We start off the comic with Twilight planning a gift-giving list for Heartswarming Eve. And let's just say that Twilight loves to plan way, way in advance. Like, I think this is probably somewhere around April. Well, Spike specifically says that it's months away, so that, I would say, is probably less than half a year. (laughs) Yeah, six months. You know what's funny? Because the comic came out on December 14, 2016, so the joke didn't really impact that hard. So it's like, hmm, wait, this comic came out in... December 14. Christmas is December 25th. That's like 11 days away. No. We need to rush. We need to rush. Comic is in the past. 
Oh no! <laughs> uh, but still, Twilight has a plan, and she kind of found the perfect gift for, or the perfect gift idea for Princess Celestia, and that's to organize and get some book from the castle of the two sisters to give her. And you know what this means, Twy? Book sorcation! Yay! Of course, she would make some sort of book vacation combo word. Yep. I think Twilight has maybe, like, a small dictionary filled with words where she's mashed the word book into it to create a new word. So wait, there's book sorcation, um, book... But uh, what? That was that one from What About Discord? I forgot what she called it. Oh wow, I, I don't remember that one. But still, a uh, mesh book into everything. So yeah. Uh, but anywho, she thinks that this would be a good idea and decides to kill two birds with one stone by getting Starlight involved with the book's location. Um, put giving her a friendship lesson and also, uh, what was it again? Friendship lesson and I, I forgot the other thing. And Celestia's housewoman gift. Ah, yes. Twilight seems to be establishing herself as a bit of a downer for the whole party. First, she nearly gives Aloysius a heart attack, and now she's volunteering everyone to sort the books in the in the castle of the royal sisters, which is still ruins. And I gotta ask, why are those books still there? I always figured that they transplanted the books from there into Twilight's new castle. Because you're just leaving them exposed in the middle of a hostile forest. Uh, I've been uh, listening to Inkheart, book on tape, and the characters there would have a conniption if they knew that you'd left books exposed to the elements like that. They'd probably be calling for pony blood. Of course, Starlight has the mammoth book of spells on hand. Now made from real mammoth. Oh god, no. No wonder they're extinct. And of course, she's not really big on going into the middle of a dangerous forest to sort through books when she could learn a spell here at home, but Twilight has mastered Fluttershy's passive-aggressive tendencies. She knows just what to say to inspire the right amount of guilt. So much guilt. That's a friendship lesson that Twilight needs to learn. How not to guilt trip your friends into doing things when they obviously don't want to do them. That's a very bad lesson for kids to learn, to guilt trip and manipulate people into doing things with you. <laughs> uh, but still, uh, it gets the story progressing. And come on, I do think that Fosca draws these ponies adorable. Twilight's enthusiasm and then her downtrodden look, uh, the way her, her hair just droops and her wings are are hanging limp. You can just see the joy flowing out of her. And so it's like, what? What have I done? We fast travel to the castle of the two sisters. And we see that Starlight has a way of doing things. And Twilight has a way of doing things. And Twilight wants to do by category, which is spell books, encyclopedias of creatures and whatnot. While Starlight wants to do things by age with the idea of uh, older books have more powerful spells. But Twilight says, oh man, that's not efficient. So they kind of don't argue but disagree and they go on. And they do comment that, hey, why is this place very dusty? And Twilight did mention that, yeah, it is dustier than before. I do wonder why. And Spike you know, founds a book called The Ferocious Flora of Everfree Forest. And somehow we see the plant from Plants vs. Zombies here, somehow. Uh, spraying some kind of gas at Spike, making him sneeze something ferocious, where he spits fire. Oh, that's not safe. With books. He almost wrote Aloysius. Oh no. Spike says he's sorry because somehow it's dusty here. And the plant kind of does it again. And yeah, um, Twilight suggests that, hey, um, Spike, why don't you go clean somewhere else? And Spike's very happy to oblige. My initial impression uh, from when they enter this and they comment that it's dusty, my first thought actually was, well, no, duh. <laughs> because if you look at it, there is no roof on this section of the library. Like, yeah, that's completely open space at the top of the bookshelf. So I was like, yeah, of course it's dusty. But I also have to question, 
How do the books start survive this long in an open room? Maybe they're magically protected? Oh, that would have to be. Although I have to praise Owlicious, because he's the only one who seems to be paying attention. And of course his woos go unnoticed, because only the ponies seem to be affected by whatever these thum vines are. And I don't know the last time I, that, pan, that uh, plants had eyes. But anywho, we continue on to the next page, where um, Twilight and Starlight argue some more. And it seems that the plants are causing more havoc by somehow creating more dust. And yeah, um, as they fight, the plant seems to be invading and kind of doing something screwy by going through gargoyles and whatnot, and going to armor and stuff. And while this is happening, Spike finished reading his comic and take a look see at the book he picked up, which was the... Uh, what would you call this? Ferocious flora of ever free forests. And he noticed that, hey, this plant seems familiar. What is this again? Dust vines? Oh no. What does this plant do? And it seems that this plant caused ponies to fight with one another and feeding off their emotions, their, what you call this, aggression. Oh yeah, no, any, anything that, that feeds off negative emotions and can also at the same time cause people to feel negative emotions is a very dangerous like we saw that in rainbow rocks with the sirens they they fed off negative energy but they could cause people to give it off so they they basically an inf- infinite loop of gaining power mm, true 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 but still um at least the sirens were good looking the plants here not so much well they make up for that in time though oh yeah true with managing to wind themselves through empty suits of armor and control them, and even stone gargoyles, they manage to somehow invade and control. You got to really question how malleable this rock is. It's true because you know what the logic in comic books. Let's not question it. Now I will say there's a weird contradiction here. The ruins of the castle look very accurate to the show. It's clear that that Jay Foskett really did his homework on that design, or at least was given proper references. But then, when given the photo of the armor that's in the castle, it looks nothing like it. It's a completely different set, and it looks great. I I like the design. I think the head crests look a bit like can openers. (laughs) Sergeant, Corporal Jenkins is trapped in his armor. Well, deploy your can opener extensions. It could save a life. But compared to the black and violet uh, armor we saw back in Castle Mania... I, it's it's too big a jump for me. And if I, you had to make me choose, I actually would prefer the black armor from Castlemania because it looked cool. It looked very cool. Now, as we go further into the comic, as the tension between Starlight and Twilight mounts, backgrounds become less frequent. At first, they're going through, and you see bookshelves, you see, well, sometimes the books are solidly defined, other times it's just... uh sort of brown rectangles with a few slashes through them to imply books, which I think can be effective. You're not meant to read every cover, so sometimes just implying they're present is all you need. But as things go along, the backgrounds quickly become more gradients. And this is where I want to compliment Heather Brecker on color choice. One, she did a really good choice with Twilight's Library. Though it wasn't the same blues and violets as in the show, I actually prefer this comics depiction more because the place looks a little bit warmer. I still don't like the chill, the chilled look of Twilight's home. It's not a place where it looks like you can relax. It looks like a place where you're frozen or where you're just sort of closed off from everyone. You'd think the Castle of Friendship would be a little bit warmer or inviting, or at least there'd be a few sections that were more comfortable looking as Twilight's home. I still think Twilight's home looks very sterile. Now, as we transition to the Castle of Two Sisters, which, funny enough, is just as uninviting, but at least it has ruins as an excuse, uh, the backgrounds become more gradients as we go further along. But sometimes they're stony uh, gray colors, sometimes they're orange and yellows, and sometimes they're bright pinks to really add a sense of uh, danger or energy to the situation. As these vines start possessing armor and somehow moving uh, 
statues, which is impressive. It's the ultimate wet willy. <laughs> Possession willy. Woo! But here's the thing. The entire conflict between uh, Twilight and Starlight is made worse by the dust vines. These things that just sort of puff hostility into the air. On the one hand, it's not like the frustration isn't between them, as established when they were about to leave. Starlight wants to do things her way. Twilight, of course, is very controlling when it comes to uh, a project. She likes to plan everything out and is used to being in charge. So you have a freer, more independent mind versus a more authority mindset. And, of course, that's going to create conflict on its own. But the minute the dust finds start amplifying that, you wonder, well... Is this argument really born from within, or is it just the influence of the dust vines? And I always feel like that limits a story when you can blame an external factor for how a character behaves. There are times where this has been done well. Case in point, DC Comics with uh, Green Lantern Rebirth. They found a way to turn around a very large character assassination for hero Hal Jordan by blaming a fear entity. But here, the ponies aren't being possessed. They're just being sort of influenced. And you're like, well, beat the plants, but how much are they really going to grow from this? There's the big question. But still, after Spike gives the book to Twilight to read, she discovers that, oh no, this vines or whatever it is, is affecting our emotions. Starlight, create a force field. I'll have to see if there's a counter spell to it. While she's reading, Twilight asks... Starlight to give her some more time while she really, really finds something. And Starlight here has a really awesome spell that made everyone grow. Well, everyone that's willing to fight, which is Aurelicious herself and Spike, which is awesome. Q Power Rangers team here. And just in the nick of time, considering the the, the vines have con- gathered a bunch of uh, rock from the castle walls, twisted themselves around each other and become a giant plant golem. <laughs> Make my monster grow! <laughs> I mean, I've fought against shambling mounds in D&D before, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> okay, if this were in a D&D game, how bad is the situation? And how high was the role for the DM to get it to this size? Well, if this was D&D, it would probably start this size to begin with if if the DM was mean. Or it would probably take a few turns to get to the size, but it would be a very difficult fight. Because it seems to be actively intelligent, as opposed to most plant creatures being no more intelligent than a beast and running on instinct. This, this seems to have the active intelligence to be able to manipulate objects. And from what I read further, they say that they have a hive mind mentality. Oh yeah, hive mind, which is very, very dangerous. Uh, anything that's a hive mind in most uh, fictional universes will boil down to consume everything. Oh god! And the whole will always work for the one. Oh god! So every individual member only ever does something if it's the will of the whole. Oh wow! Alrighty then. So yeah, mm, stone golem. Uh, not fun. Stone Golem, not fun. But, like I mentioned before, um, Starlight makes everyone grow, and they have an awesome battle here. Yeah! But it's also here that we can really hash into Jay Foskett's artwork and the concept of perspective. Now, in the scene where Starlight makes the others grow, or at least uh, Owlish is Spike and herself, there's good perspective there because you see Twilight and Spike and Starlight, their original sizes, but also their grown sizes, and they're set against the giant uh, stone monster. There's an orange backdrop, so there's not a lot of background elements with which to compare them. But you see just how much they've grown. Now, fast forward a few panels, and suddenly you're not really sure how far apart they stand. You're not sure uh, how large they are in relation to one another. Case in point, Twilight is in the lower left corner of one uh, panel on page 2022, I believe. I'm reading from a PDF, so it's always hard to tell. They list all the covers in these things. But Twilight is reading one cover. Starlight has very looks very marshmallow-like. I'm kind of envisioning the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man battering a building because she's swinging away at this uh, rock monster. Because the background is just an, a gradient of red, orange, and yellow, there's no background elements to really give us a sense of distance. I can't tell how big Starlight is in comparison to Twilight in this one. 
Maybe she's far away, but still giant. Maybe she's standing right next to Twilight, and Twilight should be more concerned about being squished. The next panel has Spike stepping on the suits of armor he saw earlier. So if I go back a few pages, I can have a piece of reference for how much he's grown, but that means I have to do a compare and contrast between pages. I have to stop reading to really appreciate the size difference. So while this is happening, um, Twilight discovered a spell, or the counter spell, or the spell, whatever it is, and... The spell is, from both of us together, together we're friends. If we understand each other, our great strength will blend. And repeat this on and on, till the stone golem gets weaker and weaker. And that's why um, our leishes got to use Gus. And at the same time too, don't forget Twilight used her laser beam. And Spike used flamethrower. And beforehand, Twilight Glimmer just pushes the thing to the wall. Yay! And with that, the plant is defeated and our three giant friends shrink. Having read Guardians of Harmony, Spike's awe, are we shrinking already? Well, don't worry, Spike. You'll get another chance. Oh, you'll get another chance in a non-Cadden comic. And yet, Starlight's head stays quite large. (laughs) Uh, yes. And again, it's this whole topic of it feeds on negative emotions, but it tried to kill you. I mean, if its goal was to take the, um... If its goal was to take the book and protect itself, then really it should just overwhelm them with vines, take the book, and then slither away. Let them argue with one another about who lost the book. Sometimes the aggressors in these stories don't always make the most sense. At least you you can look at it from a third-party perspective and say, hang on, that doesn't seem like a very good plan. And yes, you say it in that accent. But anywho, um, Spike was really happy for this and says that, yo, Starlight, could you do this next time? I want to show rarity. And Starlight says, sorry, man, this spell is a one time you sold me. Which kind of begs the question, what kind of spell is this? I don't know, but I, I wonder if the size is proportional to the amount of power put behind it. Because if it's a one-time use, I could see it easily create, making them a lot larger than it did. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of, okay, this spell's only one-time use, so be careful with how you use it. Oh, wait, what? You're using this situation? Are you sure? Oh, okay. Yeah, e- even in D&D, one-time use spells are very, very rare outside of magic that you're using from, like, a scroll. And that kind of scroll can be rewritten again, right? Easily, uh, easily replicated, right? Oh yeah, you can you can create more scrolls, but when, on a on a spell scroll, once you've used the spell from it, everything on the scroll, like all the 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 writing, disappears. You can write it again, but that requires time and equipment. Yeah, so it's not well. It's a one time use for that situation. Yeah, but it's, you get what I mean. But anywho, um, as Twilight read the book some more, yeah, it explains the whole. Um, dust spore or dust vines and it seems that it's called squirm spore and it agitates the ponies or whatever is nearby except dragons to cause them to be angry at one another this happens with star sword the bearded and his manticore friend melvin they argued the vines got into their golem form and star sword and melvin here compromised and defeated the golem it seems that even Star Swirl had trouble finding friends. And in all honesty, Star Swirl was never the best at finding friends. At least his friends were cool. I mean, I would trade ten boring friends for something as cool as a manticore. Yeah, true that, true that. And of course, the ponies do learn something from the event. They learn a little bit more about cooperation and understanding one another. And they do look adorable. I still think that Foskett's artwork is very cute in depicting these ponies. But speaking of artwork, there's a little bit of controversy outside. Apparently, when this comic came out, some folks were so dissatisfied with the artwork. They liked the story, but they felt the artwork didn't live up to it. So they uh, contacted a guy named Pencils online. Apparently, Pencils' real name is Tony... Oh, I am going to make a butchery of this pronunciation. Kusitso. Kusitso? Kusitso. I'm going to say Tony Kusitso who he does a lot of artwork. He's apparently written the comic Anon Pies Adventures, which I confess I have not read, so I can't speak to that. But he is a very talented artist. And so he took a stab at redrawing one page. And it is really well drawn. 
There's no question that. I am not questioning his skill with artwork. But I want to caution folks. Redrawing a page where you have no managing editor, no deadlines, no one else asking for your talent right away. Yes, you can produce some amazing stuff. But there's more to the being a comic book artist than just drawing something new, just drawing pages. You have to be a reliable artist. You have to be able to communicate with teams. You have to meet deadlines. I don't know what kind of challenges Jay Foskett and other uh, comic artists face. And that's why I always hesitate to make a, a judgment on their career. I say this because Pencils has been hired to at least do a cover for IDW's comics. I believe it'll be for uh, French of His Magic issue 58. But word is that he'll also be uh, drawing an entire comic. And I'll look forward to seeing what he produces. But I'm wondering what perspective he'll bring saying, okay, this is what I thought before I started drawing for the comic. This is what I think after. And it's very possible that he'll say, yeah, it's exactly what I thought. And I'm a better artist. Or he might say, wow, there are things I didn't know what was going on. I suddenly understand more. It could be either. Or it could be uh, somewhere in between. But it'll be fascinating to see. But again, this gets to the whole point of we as fans enjoy greater connectivity, the people who produce this entertainment. We can post on Twitter. We can message folks. We have, there was for a time, an IDW forum, though I think that got closed down because people take this connectivity for granted. I'm saying this as someone who grew up in the 80s. People would still write into comic books. They would write into television shows. Believe me, parents had a lot to say after Optimus Prime got killed. And then G.I. Joe the movie uh, features one of the lead heroes getting impaled by a serpent, of all things. It can freak a kid out. And, of course, parents are going to voice their their frustration and anger. But in a way, those letters have to go through a mail process. They can be filtered. They can be organized. Here, in this modern age of connectivity, you can be bombarded on all sides. And while fans may think, well, they should be heard, these criticisms should be acknowledged, okay, but consider that messages are best conveyed when they're channeled properly. It's not if you bombard someone with the same message at every turn, suddenly what might be even a minor criticism sounds like it's the biggest thing in the world, simply by volume and bombardment. So I want to caution people not to take the, this benefit of being able to tweet at authors, to tweet at artists and animators, uh, to post Facebooks, or in my case, to make YouTube reviews. We have a wonderful opportunity to connect with people, but at the same time, with that comes a responsibility to put effort into how we express our communication. And I think it is possible to say, hey, I enjoy your work, but I think you could improve on this aspect, rather than saying, you suck, stop writing, stop drawing. Because that instantly, that message is dead in the water. No human being is going to... Uh, really act on a stranger's denouncements. Or if they are, that means they're already very, very uncertain about their own position. All I'm asking for is that we approach these people with respect and, if possible, agree on one channel of communication with which to reach them so it doesn't become a flood that drowns out talent. Yeah, I have to agree with you if that, Silver, because I've read through uh, Pencil's work, uh, the Pie Sister thingy, yeah, and he does good art, and I, I don't know what to think because his art is really awesome and whatnot, and yeah, it's really awesome for him to be working with IDW, with the Pony Comics, but I do hope that he learns something out of this because, to be fair, working for a major company with high pressure can't be easy, can't be easy, and that's why uh, you've been quiet for a bit. I haven't really done a lot of reviewing, as, and I, as I said earlier, this is probably the third comic I've sat down and read, so I don't have a lot to say about it. I felt that the fight that they had was really kind of forced in, not as forced in as some of the plot points that the show has had to deal with, but I still felt that it was a bit of a stretch because their conversation at the start was about one thing, but when they started arguing, it seemed like they were talking about something completely different, and I, I, it felt a little jarring. Mm, I can understand, and the comic here has to end on a high note. 
But still, um, it seems that everybody is happy with how the outcome is. And looks like Twilight caught Spike reading comics. Ha ha ha. Oh boy, you Spike, you and your comics. And with that, the comic ends. Anyway, let's go to final thoughts. Silver, what do you think? I enjoyed the story. I find it just a little artificial uh, because of the Squirm Spores influence on Twilight and Starlight. In some ways, it feels more of an engineered conflict. At the same time, I'm always grateful when there's a, when there is a physical danger in Equestria. That's not this place where you can just skip around without a care. Every now and again, you've got to deal with a monster. And yes, that is my hardcore fantasy side talking, but also just the desire that even in paradise, you have to deal with an issue. And then it's a test of how you handle yourself during and after the conflict. And I think Starlight and Twilight play off one another, but I would very much enjoy if Starlight could have a chance to work with other ponies, to expand her circle even further. She's got Trixie, she's got Maud, but she also does have the main six or the Cutie Mark Crusaders to work with. It'd be interesting to see how she plays off of them. And Twy, what about you, man? Like, besides the whole things that you mentioned earlier? Well, overall, this, this might tell sort of jarring like the, the rapid change into how the argument goes and how kind of forced in that was i thought it was pretty good story overall compared to other things i've seen before i enjoyed the art style bar like the size of the ponies heads being occasionally too big i enjoyed how spike was this whole uh this comic he, he was he even though he did sort of sneak off to read comics, he did put the comics down and go, I'm actually going to work. And he was helpful when he came running back after reading about the comics and realizing, oh no, that's what that plant was. This is bad. And goes back to warn the others to the point where even when he, uh, Aloysius takes the book from him so Twilight can get it, he's yelling out page 52, page 52. He, he's taken note down so be that helpful. Plus, any comic that goes, okay, we're going to use Spike's Flame Breath as a weapon, that's already got a positive note from me, because we all know a, a dragon's fire breath is primarily a weapon. It's the thing that they use to fight in most fiction. And we rarely get to see Spike doing that. He, most of the time when we see his, his fire breath, he's either hiccuping, sneezing, or he's sending letters or, or receiving letters. We rarely see him use it in, in any other means. Or uh, we see him being used as a lighter by Applejack. That's cute. <laughs> oh, yes. Using him as a lighter is great. Even when he uses it on uh, that on himself when he's trying to light the bonfire for the Equestria games and he's he's cracking his head back like a, a Zippo lighter. <laughs> that, that's fun. Oh, but still, but still. Uh, so? Yeah, like, I, I enjoyed... This, this comic, I, I didn't, I couldn't think of anything super great to say about it or anything that was super bad. I enjoyed it. I, I don't get why everyone is up in arms over, over this, uh, art style. Alrighty then, alrighty then. And as for me, I do like this comic. How do I put this? J. Foskett's art, you know what? I'm not gonna harp on J. Foskett's art anymore because like I mentioned before, if you're not used to it, then it's not for you. For me, I've gotten used to it. I like his art style and it's grown on me. It's, I, I find the, the quote unquote chibi look appealing. So, um, as for the comic itself, the story's not bad. The argument here before, like Twy mentioned, was kind of here and there. It, first they were talking about one thing and then the end. Yeah, but still, I attribute that to the plants, um, playing with their emotions or playing with their feelings. But the fight scenes were cool, the way that the characters were written here were okay too. And yeah, having a comic involving a delicious spike, let's just say everybody living in the Friendship Castle, it's fun. It's fun to see them go out and have adventures. And yeah, th this is a fun read. Like, it's a fun read to have. At least we get to see the Castle of the Two Sisters play a part again. Anyway... As we end the comic here, we head off to another review. And next week, we're going to review the pony episodes. Yay! And what episode might that be? Well, audience at home, 
we will be reviewing Season 7, Episode 8, Hard to Say Anything. Oh boy, this one is a fun episode. Whew, what can I say? It's hard to say anything, really. <laughs> no? With a joke that bad, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, alrighty then. <clears throat> uh, but anywho, stick around for next week as we review that. But anyway, if you guys at home would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash the MBS show. And with every support, you'll get full access to deleted content and exclusive from the show. And also early access on the review and discussion podcast. And a huge thank you from me. And talking about thank yous, I like to thank Lurker Cat, Twilight Genesis, Nemtrakatoria, Starstream, Master of Leg, and also Jeffrey. Thank you so much, y'all, for the support. And to you, Master of Leg, a very special thank you for sponsoring the show. Thank you, thank you very much. So, anywho, I have been Roman Sanzo. And I am the Silver Quill. I've been Twilight Genesis. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode. See ya. Adios. Cheers. Haha, <laughs> uh, I knew that plants were evil. I remember watching it in that one movie. Evil Dead, was it? Oh, that plant was evil. I just remember that other plant. Even though I haven't seen the movie, I know the line very well. Feed me Seymour. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh no.